agree with that. We but thought... people already left, so. <laughs> um, yeah, so we do want to talk about using machine learning um, to solve security problems. Um, who's here is familiar with machine learning? So a few of you, good. Well, we're going to kind of take a more basic approach. Um, we're not going to, you know, get too technical, at least into the math, but this is more of an implementation talk. Um, but before we get into that, uh, my name is Jason Montgomery. I'm a principal researcher at Vericode. We do binary static analysis um, and uh, research on other interesting topics, um, such as machine learning. Um, I've been doing AppSec for probably eight years, and I was a software developer before that for about 15. Um, and uh, this is Ryan. I'll let him introduce himself. Yep. Hi, I'm Ryan Seavey. I work for HP Enterprise Security Services. I'm on their threat and vulnerability management team. I've been doing that for about a year and a half at this point. Um, did anyone here see our DerbyCon talk where we use machine learning to make a video game anti-cheat? Anyone at all? <laughs> all right. So we use machine learning to make a video game anti-cheat. Uh, we did that in 2014. And then from that, we kind of spun it off. Uh, a lot of the feedback we got was, well, how do we apply this to InfoSec and what can it do and things of that nature. So. This year, we started a new project. It's called Project Nexosis, uh, where we are basically trying to solve a lot of the security issues using different methods of machine learning. So just a quick review of our anti-cheat. Uh, when we did it, we were still learning a lot. We basically took a class uh, that was taught by Sanford, and it was a machine learning class, and went through that, then we basically said, okay, well, let's apply this to something. So we thought video game cheating. Well, that's something kind of interesting because that's been going on since video games were ever created. Right. So the basic premise was if you cheat in a video game, you're, you're doing something that's not normal, right? It's, it's not typical behavior. Uh, we were about 86% accurate when we finally released a proof of concept model but we had a lot of data issues. And that's, that's kind of probably one of the big takeaways with machine learning is you need to make sure that your data is good, right? If you just, if you have crap data, you're probably going to get crap results. Yeah. And, and what was interesting though was even with some crap data, we got fairly good results as far as predicting, maybe not cheaters so much, but we had 80% chance of predicting whether you were going to get VAC banned by, by Valve. Um, so it may not have been a, a clean, you're going to be cheating, but it was more that you're likely to get banned, <laughs> which is an interesting nuance and, and way to look at that data. Um, and we were pretty happy with the results, even though um, it, it didn't, the data was pretty bad. Um, we, uh, with that one, we used a boosted decision tree, which we'll get more into all the nuances of those later. So specifically this talk and what we're going to try to accomplish here in the next 45 minutes. So. We're going to start off by identifying some InfoSec issues. Then we're going to talk a little bit about big data. Uh, there is a talk right after this one that where I believe that he's going to go a little bit deeper into big data. So if you're interested in that, maybe check that out. Uh, then we'll start going into machine learning, some of the algorithms to use that are fairly easy to get started with, uh, i.e. decision trees. And then we'll talk about when you might want to use what type of algorithm. Uh, so the overall goal, though, is to just start thinking outside the box, right? Uh, there's lots of problems in the InfoSec world today. I think that we can all agree with that. If not, then we'll start going to that now. <laughs> um, the, the other thing, um, when we took the, ta the class, um, it was calculus heavy. Um, and while I do have a good amount of calculus in my schooling, you know, I had to, it's been about 20 years since I'd looked into it. So... I had to brush up on that, and there was a lot of, um, it just wasn't really ready to be applied, um, at least in the class that we took. Um, so we did some more um, research, and um, we wanted to focus talks more on um, just how to make this more accessible to the general practitioner and not worry about the math, but how can we use the, the things that people have built on that math in an effective way. Um, so we're not really, this isn't training per se, and it's not we're not really going to get into the math at all um, because I'm not the one to give that talk anyway. So first thing first, let's do a quick experiment by pulling the audience. 
All right. How about we do it this way? Um, raise your hand when you think that your company that you work for today would be capable of detecting a breach, i.e. someone's in your network. You know, how long do you think it would take you before someone figured out, hey, we got a problem here? If you think that you guys would be able to figure that out in minutes, raise your hand. How about hours? Few. Quite, a, okay. quite a few people think hours. Okay. How about under a day? Okay. Under a week? It's, it's more. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> Let's just see when we get everyone to raise their hand, okay? So under a week. If you think that you guys can do under a week, raise your hand. So almost, almost everyone. Under a month? I hope everyone's raising their hand, maybe. <laughs> well, some people might be hiding. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so it's interesting that uh, so many people think that it will be under, uh, especially under a day, right? So if you look back at like the 2013 breach report, it was saying that 56% of all breaches remain undetected for months or years even. And I do a fair amount with our uh, digital investigation service team at HP. I can tell you that very, very rarely have people ever been able to detect a breach that was like an actual breach. I mean, I'm not talking about something fake, but a real breach in under a day. So breaches keep taking place, right? I, I mean, pick a recent company, uh, Sony, Home Depot, Anthem, pick whoever you want. What security controls do you think that they had in place at Home Depot, Sony? I mean, do, do you think that they, they probably had next generation firewalls there? They probably did an annual <laughs> penetration test. They probably did a lot of the things that we all tell everyone to do. Um, usually it has something related to user or how they have controls around users, right? And I think as InfoSec people, we always say, well, stupid user, right? I've heard that at a conference before. Blame the stupid user for, you know, doing something that was dumb. But it's really not their fault, right? I mean, it's our fault as InfoSec people. I, I mean, if we're letting the user do those things, it's really on us. I mean, it's not on them. It's not their fault they clicked the link. <laughs> so I found this. It's <laughs> a good one, yeah. Made me laugh. I thought that this is pretty, pretty typical of some of the places that I've been. You know, we do security awareness training, and as you can tell in the cartoon here, the entire audience is on their smartphones or in their books. They're not really paying attention to the security training. Um, and, you know, let's say, hey, maybe we need to rethink this presentation. Yeah, and the, just the idea that a link would just compromise your entire network is pretty ridiculous. I think it's, it's, it's not just an infosec failure. It's an IT design and a software design failure too. It's not just an InfoSec problem. It's a industry-wide development, IT, and InfoSec, I think, failure to protect our networks. So we want to take this a little bit farther. Uh, we recently started doing some surveys um, of people in the IT industry. So this is all of our own data. Uh, we just started doing this. This is, right now, it's just, you know, it's directional data for us. Um, we did about 100 people so far. Most of the respondents were CIOs or higher. Uh, the margin of error for this, again, since it is a relatively low sample pool, it's about plus and minus 9%. Um, so the first thing that we asked was, uh, what was their budget like, right? Uh, and these were all for companies that had above 500 employees. So you can see someone doesn't have much of a budget at all. Uh, we can probably guess what might happen there. Yeah, under 50,000 or 50 to 100,000 isn't really a lot um, if you have over 500 people in your organization, I would think. And we don't actually have this up there, but I can tell you that of everyone that we polled, um, information security was the number one focus for all of these companies. The next highest was cloud and it was significantly less than InfoSec. Yeah, so they did have big emphasis on on their roadmap, InfoSec was a big problem they were going to address without having, with some having a lot of budget and, uh, and some having no budget. So. so then we asked them, you know, what, what do they think they would be good at preventing? 
Um, and this might be a little bit hard to read. But so the first one right there, the question was, how good do you think that you'd be at preventing no one attacks, right? Things that we've seen before. Uh, most people said that they would be, the blue bar is five out of five, right? They, they felt pretty confident. Hey, you know, we can stop the known stuff. Uh, then you can kind of see a lot of people gave it a four star rating. A few gave it a three star rating and almost no one selected two stars or one star. Uh, then the next question was, well, what about unknown attacks? Oh, days, stuff like that. Yeah, that's the middle column. Um, and you can see it's a little bit more diverse. Um, you have a couple people who still think they're really good at that, but you, you, it's more four and three stars. Uh, and then finally, the last one was social engineering attacks. And again, I mean, people still fall within that five to three star range, right? I mean, no one out there is saying, oh, well, we just really, you know, we suck at that. Yeah, everyone thinks they'll pretty much catch most everything. Yeah, And it's really kind of surprising too, though, because Breaches keep happening, and I think the ex-NSA director just said, you know, almost every major American corporation has been breached. So, I mean, I don't know how much he knows, but hey, <laughs> that's what he said. It's an interesting data point, to say the least. And finally, uh, one of the other things that we pulled out of the survey was detection, which we kind of did with you guys. Uh, again, the industry kind of as a whole was saying, look, we're, we're, we're pretty, we think that we can detect stuff, right? So within 24 hours, was kind of the clear winner, and then you know people still think that they can do it uh, within a few hours and less than an hour. Yeah. So you have seventy percent within twenty-four hours, essentially. Right, um, but I think you know think of all the recent breaches; those none of those were really caught within hours. Those were all days, months before anyone detected anything on the network. So with all that being said, obviously there's some kind of disconnect out there. Uh, we wouldn't be having the scale of breaches that we have if all things were, were you know, if people actually didn't think maybe that they were so well protected. Uh, it's almost like a false sense of security, if you will. Yeah. So I think, you know, this is just us personally. I think that security as a whole might be in a little bit of trouble. I think that we need to start doing far more innovative research in the industry. Um, you know, the f some stuff in the community needs to change. I don't really want to go into that right now, but security is hard, right? It's really, really hard. If you're really doing security, it's not easy. Yeah. And one of the things that I've seen recently, and I was guilty of this too, it's it's so cool and it's so sexy to be on the red team and to be a pen tester. Yeah. I have I know so many friends that they don't want to do the defense stuff, they just want to go be a pen tester. And that's all well and fine, but I mean do in this room, do you guys really think that a pen test does that much value today? And what I mean by that is, you know, this is my primary job right now is to do pen test. But I think people are doing it wrong. <laughs> but what I mean by that is this. So how many of you guys have pen tests done? You guys have it all set up, you know, the IPs are gonna be ta targeting roughly when they're gonna be taking place. How many of you guys tell your ops team that this pen test is gonna be taking place? Just show of hands, does anyone tell the ops team? Some do. So some do, but. Yeah. My question to those that don't is why not? Why not test your operational team and see, hey, could we actually see what was going on during this pen test? Like you have people in your environment hitting it. If your ops team cannot detect that, you might have a problem because I mean, you, you know, I mean, you told them, look, this window, people are gonna be hitting these IP addresses. Can you see it, yes or no? So now let's segment. <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about big data. Yeah, there's a, there's definitely a trick with, I mean, if you're looking at network traffic, you're gonna have a data problem pretty quickly because there's a lot of it generated everywhere in your organization. Um, the more nodes you have, obviously, the more data you need to store, and uh, it's, it's a tough problem. And so what's cool, though, with big data being a thing now, um, there's a lot of solutions out there for it. And we'll, we're gonna talk lightly about some of those, how to handle this flood of data, and then, do things efficiently and quickly uh, to get results and find things in that data set. Because um, if you collect all this data and then you can't analyze it, what's the point, right? Um, so most people, I think, just say, well, we can only look at this stuff um, 
a small subset of it, or we can just look at production, or we can just look at this system, right, effectively. Um, and, and there's really a lot more you can do with some of the machine learning and the big data uh, technology that's available now. All right, so the first thing with big data, this is kind of a really dumbed down version of what you can do, right? So step one is get your data. But how do we get data? Well, maybe start taking PCAPs. That might be an easy way to start getting some kind of data that you can do some kind of analysis on. So once you start getting all this data, you need to put it somewhere. And then, like Jason was saying, well, what do we do now? We have all the data. So who here has heard of Hadoop? Raise your hand. Oh, a lot. Good. Amazing. <laughs> <laughs> How many people here could get up right now and explain to everyone what Hadoop is? Okay, so a few people. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a quote on what Hadoop is. Uh, it's basically Hadoop is an open source software framework for storing and processing big data in a distributed fashion on large clusters of commodity hardware. Essentially, it accomplishes two tasks, massive data storage and faster processing. How many people now know what Hadoop is? <laughs> yeah, I took uh, several conversations when I first read about it to like, well, no, does it do this? No, 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 that's this other thing. Does it do this? No, that's, yeah, it, it's... It's a tricky to get your mind around exactly what, it's, it's a little nebulous. So Hadoop, it's, it's really an ecosystem. It's this framework that has all these different tools in it. Uh, it supports structured and unstructured data. Uh, yeah. it, and those tools being APIs too. You, you do have to write code or hook up things to it sometimes as well. Um, other things may be automated scripts or, or jobs you can run. So the ecosystem looks a little bit like this. Um, I think some of those companies might have been acquired in the top right now. <laughs> but for the most part, yeah. this is what Hadoop looks like. So, you know, the main core components are MapReduce and the Hadoop uh, file system. Th those are the main things. And then if you look down at the bottom, those are some of the tools that you can use with it to accomplish different tasks. We'll go into some of those a little bit later. Then there's a whole bunch of different distributions, uh, HDP, Cloud Air, uh, probably some of the more commonly used ones. Right. So this is what HDP looks like. <laughs> <laughs> there are so uh, many moving parts it's, it's that you can, you can deploy and have available. It's pretty crazy. So there is a lot of time. If you want to get up to speed on this stuff, you're going to have to do a lot of reading on and, and try to find just a few things to bite off first. You're not going to obviously roll out this whole, and I don't know that anyone ever would, but um, it, you kind of have to figure out what, what pieces and parts you need to get the job done. Right. There's so many tools, and some of them are so similar in their function, you really have to start digging around. A uh, good example is, so there's something called Kafka, then there's yeah. Flume, and then there's um, Spark, and you, there's all these different things that really, if you look at it from a high level, they sound like they do the same thing, but they all do it differently. <laughs> and, <laughs> and you, you might use them in different scenarios. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but but here are kind of the more commonly used Hadoop tools to get you started. Um, you guys can just kind of read that. I mean, the big thing here with machine learning, since this is a machine learning talk, ultimately, um, my out is the packaged Hadoop machine learning tool. Um, Flume is how you can kind of start getting PCAPs into Hadoop and things like that. Uh, the, the link at the bottom, honestly, if you're interested in this, go there, uh, start reading about each of these tools. It'll go into much more detail of when to use what and why. So like we said earlier, the fast, easy way, uh, if you just want to start messing around, start a PCAP, make it a CSV, or... This is how you would kind of implement a solution big data-wise, right? So you take your PCAP logs, you go to Kafka, then it would go to Spark. Again, you're going to have to do some independent research on how to implement this. <laughs> yeah, and some of this you can put in the cloud, and some of this you can deploy in boxes in, in your infrastructure if you're not comfortable with putting things out there, and that's totally understandable. Um, though you're going to need some serious infrastructure internally to do it. Um, so I don't know if you want to talk about the cost you're in into. Yeah, Iraq, but. If, uh, if you guys are curious, so Fortune 50s, when they deploy, uh, there's this tool called OpenSock. It's a Cisco-developed open source tool. 
uh, might be worth looking into, but I can tell you that it takes an entire rack of servers to successfully deploy. I think it costs around $300,000 to, to get everything more. Have you looked at this? You? No. No? Okay. <laughs> you were shaking your head no. <laughs> so anyway, it is a full rack. You need a bunch of storage. Um, it's it's very expensive to say the least, um, but it does scale, right? So if you start running out of storage, you can just add another rack into the environment, and yeah. away you go, right? Just yeah, just all these tools are made to scale up. Um, just spend readily. your entire IT budget for the year, <laughs> drop this in, and you know you'll be good. Right. Oh no. Hmm? All right. Well, so it's oh. <laughs> <laughs> on the next one, I think. No, in two more. Um, so let's talk a little bit about machine learning now, the thing that everyone cares about. So how does machine learning really work? So I found this really good example. It was from a talk recently given by one of the Google guys about machine learning. And he had these two applications up, and they were both spell check applications. One of them had 17 lines of code. The other one had 2,000 plus lines of code. And this was for the English language. Um, how many people here think that the 2,000 plus line of code was using machine learning? Well, how many people think that the 17 lines of code was machine learning? More, yeah. Yes, 17 lines of code performed about as well as the 2,000 plus lines of code open source spell check. And the reason, basically, how this all works is so he would feed in the commonly used English words into the machine learning application, and now it would be about 75% accurate, which is pretty good, all things considered. The other, the 2,000 plus lines of code, it was basically going into how language sounds, right? So like, cuh, how, you know, yeah. how many ways can you say ch in English, right? So for all of those, you had to program out like, here's how this works. So the problem with this, though, and the real power of machine learning is that 17 line of code, if your boss came to you later and said, okay, well, we're going to open up a new division now in France, so now I need a French spell check. Well, guess what? <laughs> You're going to have to go probably rewrite your 2,000 plus lines of code because you just did it only for The pronunciation's English. all different, so you'll have to do a different sound X for that or, or whatever technology you decide to use to do that. But guess what? Your 17 lines of code machine learning application, you could probably take in the commonly used French words and you're probably going to get a pretty good spell check out of it. Yeah. And this was really similar to what we saw when we did the anti-cheat. Um, I wrote a ton of code to retrieve data and we wrote no code to implement the, except for the web API call to test our user and to pull some data from a couple JSON APIs. So um, I've, I've really never written so little lines of code for a proof of concept um, with machine learning. It was really kind of refreshing um, to be able to stitch that together in a couple weeks, too, and have 80%, 86% accuracy. So um, we've seen this firsthand as well um, when, when we've implemented some of our research projects. So here's the basic machine learning uh, life cycle, if you will, right? So the first thing that you need to do is ask a question. Because if you don't know what you're trying to solve for, you're not going to get very far. So figure out, uh, InfoSec, what do we want to solve for? Well, maybe we want to see anomalies on our network. Yeah. And by the way, there are some people who say that ML isn't good at this. I disagree. It's actually really good at it today. So next step, you need to get data. Uh, we talked about this a little bit. Um, I can tell you how we get data now is we wrote some applications. They sit on hosts. They stream data to us. And then that's how we start doing uh, our cleaning of the data, right? So once you get your data, every once in a while you might have anomalies in it. And we'll go into a little bit more what that means later. But uh, when, you, when you're training models with machine learning, you don't necessarily want anomalies in your training set because it will lower your accuracy. Uh, and then finally, so once your data is all and you got it, you got it cleaned up, you got kind of the outliers, then you're going to finally run it and, you know, see what's going on. So there's a couple different um, learning styles we're going to talk about. There's a little, there's some more nuanced ones in these two, but these are the big two uh, categories of learning styles. There's supervised uh, machine learning, and this essentially is, you know, a classification. Is it, you know, one of these two things? Um, 
Google uses this to classify news, right? So does it go in politics? Does it go in technology? So they don't have people sifting through all the news sites. The computer figures out when it crawls the web where the news categories go because the content of the article is pretty much uh, an easy way for it to figure that out. Um, and then there's unsupervised, which means, actually, no, um, did I do that backwards? <laughs> so unsupervised just basically means that right. you're not feeding it the answer. Right. Um, supervised, you, you give it the answer. Unsupervised, you don't have the answer. Uh, and it just draws, it just clusters things together in categories. That's the Google learning style. I'm sorry, I had that backwards. Um, and then that's where we want to kind of focus in on anomaly detection. So let's start talking a little about... Uh, the algorithm. So there's lots and lots of machine learning algorithms. These are what I came up with is probably the things that people in this room might want to get started with, uh, especially decision trees. Decision trees are, are pretty common of, okay, well, let's go do machine learning. What do we want to do? Well, let's start with the decision tree, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. um, beyond that, there's artificial neural networks, which people hear uh, more about it. Those are really good at image recognition, things of that nature. We have a demo later on where they're doing neural networks to identify what's in the picture and how that works. Right. Um, so SVM, support vector machines, there's quite a bit of research in that field of how we can start doing anomaly detection. We'll get into that. Um, but the, the link down there at the bottom again, if you want to read about other machine learning algorithms, there's like a noodle just go there. Yeah. And we had really, the decision tree is a nice one to test out first. It's fast. And you get pretty high accuracy results um, without a lot of tuning. Um, and that, that was what we ended up using on our anti-cheat, and it worked really well. So I found this really cool kind of cheat sheet, if you will. It has a start point, and it basically will walk you through what you want to do if you have certain scenarios with your data, right? So don't want to spend too much time on this we'll make the slides available but you know it's basically saying okay well do you have more than this amount of records or this many rows or uh if you do then do this you know depending on what you want to do and what you want to accomplish you might be looking at clustering uh regressional it kind of just walks you through it's it's a pretty nice little handy cheat sheet yeah it's important to choose the right ones though for what you're trying to solve for um so it is good to get familiar with all the different types um we made lots of silly blunders, I think, early on, trying to pick, uh, you know, things that didn't fit um, for the algorithms. All right. So everyone's first deep dive into machine learning, decision <laughs> trees, hopefully. Um, a couple key things to think about decision trees and how they're used in everyday life, right? So marketing might use a decision tree to figure out if someone will buy their product. What I mean by that is maybe they want to figure out where they should put their CD on the shelf, right? Um, you can use machine learning or a decision tree to kind of figure out, well, if I put it here in the middle shelf on this aisle, it'll perform better than if I put it over here on the bottom shelf. Um, but, but one of the more recent uses of it was a Microsoft Connect. So what they did was they took one million images, uh, they took three decision trees, and they had a thousand cluster uh, yeah. core cluster of it. Everyone's familiar with Connect, right? That kind of watches you move around in the room and you can interact with your Xbox console with it. So the question is, how long do you think it took them to successfully identify body parts on the screen? Yeah. Any guesses? Six months. Six months? Anyone else? What's that? Two years? The answer is one day. In one day, they could go through their million images with three decision trees and their thousand core cluster, and now they were able to successfully identify body parts on the screen. Right. And so from that point forward, they could use that model again, and it was quick, right? So to generate the model, it was expensive. But once they had the model, it's a lot less expensive to actually use it and get some answers. So here are some advantages of a decision tree. They're relatively simple, and I say that, and I want to be careful with that. They're simple to get started with. They're, they're actually kind of complex when you want to start doing more advanced things with them. Um, you can use categorical or numerical data with right. them. They scale relatively well, and you don't really have to do that much data prep to right. get stuff to happen. 
So the big disadvantage is they create overly complex models. <laughs> um, if you start messing around with this, you'll see what I mean. But you're going to have these huge trees, and you're going to have to start doing manual pruning and things like that. Yeah. Yeah, our tree for the anti-cheat was enormous and ridiculous, and it, it was hard to read, but we didn't really care because it worked. Um, but if you want to try to figure out what it does, there's, there's not much. <laughs> it's hard to tell why it works. So, but what about InfoSec? So there's two data sets, um, or there should be two data sets, rather, the KDD99 data set, which is pretty old. There's been lots of research on why that isn't that great of a data set. And then the university in Canada decided to make the NSL KDD. Um, but apparently that's down, which is really surprising because there's tons of research that cites that data set. Yeah. Uh, I reached out to the university, and apparently they decided to take it down, <laughs> like permanently down, like it's gone now. So uh, feel free to email them and tell them to bring it back. <laughs> but uh, yeah, th there you go. We found this shirt today. I mean, you can't always blame Canada, but in this particular this instance, can, yeah. uh, I think you might be able to. <laughs> yeah. Uh, to talk a little bit about what's in these data sets. Uh, so this was all IDS type of data sets. Um, you're looking at source destination IP. You're looking at flags. You're looking at uh, log on attempts. You're looking at people who got root access, how they got root access, things like that. I mean, it's a pretty neat data set if you start looking at it and looking at some of the features that are in there. Uh, again, the NSL KDD is what everyone was using. I mean, even Microsoft has articles out there about using the NSL KDD yeah. as recently as 2014. <laughs> um, so hopefully it comes back. <laughs> All right, so now let's do a demo. So this demo that we're going to do, has anyone ever been to this site? Okay, awesome. <laughs> so this uh, company, they've been doing research with neural networks and how to successfully identify images. So we're going to just take some images and we're going to see what it says. Maybe, if it goes on the screen. <laughs> I'm going to try to set up my screen mirroring. Give me one second. I don't know any jokes. Is there a comedian <laughs> out there who can like, come up here and entertain while uh, we get this amazing demo set up? Oh, come on, Dave. <laughs> None? All, All right. right, so here we go. Scroll down. So this is essentially, um, we're going to give it some images. Yeah, we already got the images before we did this, so. We didn't know if the network would be working or how well it would be working, so. So I'm going to prove I'm not a robot. We're going to upload this picture of brain, these two um, faces facing each other, kind of icons. And it's going to predict what's in the image with this tag cloud next to it. And uh, it's already come back very quickly. And it essentially says, um, with these tags, it's a conceptual picture. It has people. Um, but it says nobody because they're not real people. Uh, it's technology. It's an illustration. There's a connection in it. There are brains shape, travel, science. So these are the things it identified using machine learning. So it's kind of like giving the computer a, a sort of sight, really. So you can give it an image. And this is, a lot. I think, a lot of how um, the driving, automatic driving works right with the cars when they're moving around the street. They, they're, they're picking things out. It's using machine learning. So yeah, the only thing that this one kind of really got wrong was travel. Like travel tag probably should not be in that image. Right. But I think you know it's seeing the gears and it's associating that with travel. Maybe some of the arrows. Um, as well. So, a castle. so let's upload a castle. All right, so here is a castle, right? And this is more in line with what we would expect it to probably tag the image with. I mean, it's architectural, it's a castle. I mean, it even identified here as a castle. This is a castle. <laughs> um, there's no people in it. It equates this with travel because it kind of does remind me of travel. Uh, history, right? Castles mm -hmm. aren't probably really built that much today. Old. Uh, fortification, building. So again, I mean, this is just machine learning in a neural network kind of way. Yeah. And it's able to successfully identify what to tag the pictures with. So we're going to upload some kids at the beach next. So here we get sea, beach, sand, summer, ocean, vacation, water, coast, bikini, and fun. So uh, pretty good 
uh, results up there too. You can also see the similar images it is already categorized too and probably used to train it in some cases um, on the left hand side there too. All right, so last one. Let's do the brewery. Let's do the brewery. So we're going to upload. I'm not a robot, I promise. So here we get industry, a room, <laughs> a tube, facility, steel, people. There's a guy there in the front. I don't know if you can see him, but he's reaching up um, in the middle of the picture there. A pipe, uh, North America, that's curious. Pub and music. So it got pub even with that picture, which is pretty cool, um, as well as a sort of industrial look. So as you guys can tell, I mean, this is, I don't know. I mean, I think this is pretty amazing, right? I mean, you're giving something a picture, and it's able to actually kind of identify what's in the picture. Uh, there's lots of other applications that are being used today, especially in the medical realm for this. Uh, right now, there's a competition going on for people who can successfully identify cataracts just using the images of, uh, you know, the back of the eye. All right, so let's talk about anomaly detection because that's probably something that you guys all care about, right? If something is weird in your network, it, you know, think of it as an anomaly. You might want to be alerted to that. I mean, how much time today do each of you spend looking through all your, all your logs, all your network logs, all your traffic logs? Does anyone sit there all day and look through those and pick out the anomalies that happened today in your environment? Anyone? <laughs> okay. Yeah. Some people, someone probably does if you don't. Yeah. What, was it a lot of fun? It was the worst security problem <laughs> I've ever seen. <laughs> so, see, that, that's, it's not <laughs> something that I don't, uh, it's not something that I think people are super excited to go do, right? Like, who wants to go do that all day? No. Uh, so, anomaly detection is used for fraud detection. We've used it for a long time, um, fault detection, things like that. Uh, the other thing that you can do with anomaly detection from a machine learning standpoint, and we kind of spoke about this a little bit before, is when you're going to train a model, you don't want anomalies in your training data sets, okay? It's going to lower the accuracy. So if you can use an anomaly detection algorithm like one class support vector machines or PCA, you're going to increase your accuracy. Yeah, so you just want to feed it the normal, right, to train it. So one class SVM, um, found this image, I thought they did a pretty good job of kind of conceptually capturing what one class SVM is and what anomaly detection is. So basically the red asterisks there are apples. Pictures the, of apples. The uh, plus sign there are pears. So it draws the line and it splits the two and it says, okay, so everything over here to the right, that's a pear, everything to the left, that's an apple. Well, then we have this one point out there at the bottom right. That's the Apple logo, <laughs> right? It, it, it is an Apple, um, but it successfully identifies that as an anomaly, right? So the classifier, you can see how it drew. Okay, so these are the normal things. We have this outlier out there. You might want to go look into what this thing is. And like I said, it's the Apple logo. Yeah. So had you trained with that, though, your circle would probably include it, and that would might be a problem. Um, depending on what you're trying to do with the, the model. So another option, if you don't want to do that, uh, there's PCA. Uh, there's lots of stuff that you can do with PCA besides anomaly detection. Uh, it's really good at compression. And so what I mean by that is you can go from 3D to 2D to 1D. And so this is going to get a little bit into math, but if you think about uh, things in 3D space, right, if we pull everything to a line like this, um, and then you can just redraw all the X's to that line, right? So PCA calculates what is the minimum distance to take each of those X's and put them on the line, and then it makes the line that, right? Um, hopefully that makes sense. Yeah, just reducing the information. It basically, you know, the right. bottom bullet point here is projection A, right? It finds the lowest value to make each of the new points on that line. Yeah. And then it will relabel it to like Z1. So if you took X1, X2, and X3, uh, compresses it all to one, i.e. Z1. All right, so some con conclusions. So um, the, really the only way to get into this is start playing around. Um, and that's, that's what we did 
with uh, a tool called Weka. So the second step is get Weka. Uh, it's a Java, a little Java program with a GUI. It's super awesome. You can just dump CSVs into it, and you can start immediately graphing and and seeing and 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 training data sets, um, filtering data, and um, do you know? You can pretty much do a lot of this stuff in there. And like we said, I would recommend starting with decision trees. You're, you're going to be able to kind of identify what it is quickly. Yeah. If you use Weka, you can even visualize the decision tree itself. It'll have it in a graphical interface. Uh, you can actually see, okay, well, here's how it started. Here's the two branches, and it's split off into four branches or whatever it is. Um, th then, you know, tying this all back into InfoSec, right? So why is machine learning so good for InfoSec? Well, like we said earlier, who's going to sit here and look at all this log data, right? No one wants to probably sit there and sift through all your company's logs if anyone's even doing that. But what if you had everything just streamed to a big Hadoop cluster and then you did machine learning and it just spat out all of the anomalies for you? Then you can just focus on those anomalies. And the way that PCA especially is going the direction with anomaly detection, um, it's very, very good at finding needles in the haystack. What I mean by that is to say that your anomaly is buried or it's nested in a bunch of HTTP traffic, right? So you might see a bunch of HTTP traffic, but something inside that. Someone's using port 80 to do something not uh, common. PCA will actually be able to dig in there and figure that anomaly out. Yeah. Here's some pictures of Weka. Um, we loaded a, a data set. Um, it has to do with wine quality, right? So you can, they uploaded a bunch of things about um, sulfur dioxide, how many chlorides, residual sugars, citric acid, sulfates, alcohol, and all this. Uh, and then you can just visualize each one of those data is graphed against every other data point. Um, yeah, and so one thing to really keep in mind here is we know nothing about wine, well, other than that I drink correct. it. It's delicious. What we said at the beginning of this was understand your data, right? You cannot just start going into this and not understanding what your features are, what it is that you're <laughs> doing. So we ran this right before we came here. We did just no for fun. pruning. Um, and it's not very accurate, right? And that's not surprising. It, it successfully identified, I think, like 57% um, for the quality of wine. Yeah. But we did no filtering, right? This was just, you know, this is the proof to you all. Don't just start throwing data in without understanding what you're giving it. Yeah, I was talking to an individual about this who got really excited about machine learning, and then he went and grabbed a bunch of data. Um, and it essentially ended up being stuff he could just graph in Excel. Uh, they were just, like, two coordinates. And he started cranking it through algorithms, and it was basically detecting nothing. Um, but he thought he had a lot of good results. <laughs> <laughs> so, it, what's that? Uh, the slide. Right. So basically, what he's saying is, look, don't don't use machine learning to to draw graphs in Excel, right? Right. There. Are, yeah. Excel, Excel does things there. well. <laughs> it can make really pretty charts and graphs. That's not the point of machine learning. Right. So the other cool thing with machine learning is, if you actually have this on the network, and let's say that you have it off the tap port on your core switch, well, guess what? It doesn't care if your device is a IoT device. It doesn't care if it's a SCADA ICS device. It doesn't care what it is, which is, you know, that's pretty powerful. Like, we don't need an agent to go out there and sit on this IoT device, right? We can just kind of put it into Hadoop and, you know, start doing analysis. Is this normal traffic for this IoT device? Yes or no? Uh, so here's some additional resources to get you started. There's a link to Weka. Uh, here's some data sets that are provided specifically for machine learning. Um, there's also a competition site. If anyone wants to join our team, Kegel, yeah. get with us. Um, there are some Horton DataWorks tutorials down at the bottom. This specific one that I linked to was uh, visualizing server data. Um, so if you go through that tutorial, it's pretty cool. It talks about how to like successfully identify a DDoS stack. Yeah. Um, and I guess what's I guess cool to follow up where Ryan talks about the last slide is. Um, a lot of places in-house can build some things pretty interesting. You don't have to necessarily have that full rack set up. If you just do some PCAPs for a while, you have enough storage for them, you can upload them and just start visualizing yourself and seeing if there's anything you need to look at, whether it's logs, whether it's network traffic, whatever. Yeah, so some parting thoughts. Um, machine learning can get really, really complex, though. So decision trees kind of where we started. Those are relatively easy. Uh, if you want to Google PAC, uh, this is still a theory. But if you start reading about it, he goes on to talk about how we can use this to maybe explain evolution and cognition and behavior, human behavior, animal behavior. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's pretty amazing where this is all headed. 
So here's uh, our contact info. Again, we have a project called uh, Nexosis. And there's a link to it. We're basically working on automation of security issues and using alerting with machine learning to tell people about uh, anomalies that are in their network. So open up the Q&A. Any questions? No, man. All right.